Are you ready? Let's go. Let's go. From AMI Central. Now circling in the neutral zone. Here's the pitch on the way. 36 yards for the win. This. Here comes a big chance. The shot is. Is this the tagger? The neutral zone. Oh, it's oh my God. This is as good as it gets. Now, here's your host, two-time Paralympian, Rock Richardson. And how's it going, everybody? I'm uh, filling in for Cam Jenkins. As you can see, I'm not Brock Richardson, two-time Paralympic champion. But um, I'm Cam Jenkins, maybe a two-time silver medalist at the Para Ice Hockey Ontario Championships, maybe? We'll go with that. <laughs> so welcome to another edition of the Neutral Zone. As I said, I'm Cam Jenkins, filling in for Brock. He's going to be back on August 1st. And coming up on today's program, we'll release another interview from the Canadian Paralympic Committee Summit, and we're going to feature Nate Reach. So, how about we get into this week's headlines? Neutral Zone Headlines. 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 Major League Baseball Home Run Derby took place on Monday. There were a couple of interesting notes. Pete Alonso of the New York Mets was trying to tie Ken Griffey Jr. with three home run derby wins in his career. Julio Rodriguez of the Seattle Mariners was trying to win at home for the first time since Todd Frazier did it back in 2015 for the Cincinnati Reds. And Vladimir Guerrero Jr. was attempting to be not only the first Blue Jay to win the event, but he was also trying to be part of the first father and son to ever win home run derbies. And he pulled off the feat. Vladimir won with a total of 72 home runs, 26 in the first round, 21 in the second round, and 25 in the final. Now, if you did tune into the All-Star Weekend, you caught the All-Star Game where the National League won 2-1 to one in a thrilling pitcher matchup. Yeah, it's just unbelievable that you don't see too many All-Star games have a pitching duel in a 2-1, considering you see so many pitchers, uh, you know, they only usually pitch two, maybe three innings at the most, so uh, that's probably the lowest uh, score in an All-Star game that I've seen. Uh, the World Para Athletics Championships are taking place in Paris, France, and it's currently going on from July 8th to the 17th. And so far, Canada has two gold, seven silver, and five bronze for a total of 14 medals. And today's uh, medalist, um, the latest in Canada's medal hall, was Renee Fussell. And uh, she won it in discus in the F38 class. The World Youth Bocce Championships took place in Povoa de Varzim, Portugal. Congratulations go to Olivier Wa for winning bronze in the individual BC2 category, with honorable mention going to Nico Yema and Carter Plum, who competed hard but ran into some tough competition in the individual BC3 category. Congratulations to all. Those are your headlines for this week, and for today's topic, we're going to be discussing the All-Star Baseball game, and just what we thought about it. Uh, Claire, do you want to go first? Um, I think I, I am on the fence when it comes to um, all-star games if I want them to be kind of a offensively focused game or if it's going to be kind of a show for how good uh, players are defensively and, and also the pitching as well, like we spoke about in the headlines that... I want to see a lot of home runs, but I also love seeing some really good catches where people are, are taking away home runs from people. So uh, it, it was a good game and uh, yeah, really good pitching. And I think that's just where baseball is these days. Like the pitching is just out of this world these days. So um, and then you have pitchers um, like Otani who are able to do both. So it's 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 uh, it's a couple of years ago, you wouldn't have caught me tuning into the all-star game and 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 this year i did and i'm 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 getting to be a big fan of it i'm i enjoy all-star weekend um i'm not necessarily a fan of the game itself um i i find that it can either be all home runs and all offense and you know pitchers that look like they're throwing beach balls or it can be almost no offense like it was this year and um I guess I like the beach balls a little better because I found this game really boring to watch. 
I really did enjoy the Home Run Derby, though. The new format where you have two players uh, facing off against each other and uh, kind of having an elimination-style tournament was was a lot of fun. Um, there, there were some, some funny moments, of course. And at one point, the cameras caught Vladimir Guerrero Jr. and Lourdes Gurriel Jr. playing rock, paper, scissors with each other from opposing dugouts, since they're now... Uh, on, on opposite sides so that was kind of fun to get to see and to, to catch but otherwise the game itself was uh, it was okay I, I was a little scared when I saw Jordan Romano leave the game after Guriel nearly hit a home run off him <laughs> um, um, you know that that pesky lower back tightness as they like to call it so I hope he's okay I haven't I don't recall seeing him in a game so far since they've come back. So no, he hasn't. I hope Jordan's all right and that he's uh, good to perform his duties when called upon. Yeah, and I just uh, saw um, today where he's not going to be pitching um, in the San Diego uh, series either. So hopefully he's going to be okay and he's not going to uh, be uh, too long before he can start pitching again. So, was was that Romano or Gosman? Because I know Gosman's out for the San Diego series. Oh, is it? Oh, maybe it was Gosman then. I think it was Gosman. Romano, I think, is available, quote unquote, but I, yeah. I don't know that he's a hundred percent. Gosman, you so. are correct. It was Gosman. Oh, good. Yeah, okay, he's not going to be available. For I thought San maybe Diego you saw series. something I didn't. No, no, no. <laughs> I, uh, that is correct. And uh, Gosman, he's been a pretty good pitcher for us. So I think that's yeah. going to be a big loss. And hopefully he's not out to too long either. So we'll see how that goes. And, you know, like, I also love the All-Star game usually, but not when it's 2-1. That's a soccer score. <laughs> and when you got to sit through nine innings of watching <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> baseball and only getting like a couple of runs, like... <clears throat> You know, if it's a World Series game, maybe that's a little bit different because you would expect them to, you know, be a bit more defensive and maybe a bit of a low-scoring game. But in an all-star game, you want to see the hits. You want to see the home runs. You want to see, you know, the hitting for the cycle or whatever the case is. So I was a little bit disappointed with that, but there were a couple of phenomenal catches in the game. Um, I guess though that was the most exciting part of it. So if you want to get a hold of us on social media, here's how you can do it. And welcome back to the Neutral Zone AMI broadcast booth. And we are set to get this ball game underway. The first pitch brought to you by Brock Richardson's Twitter account at Neutral Zone BR. First pitch, strike. And hey, gang, why not strike up a Twitter chat with Claire Buchanan for the Neutral Zone? Find her at Neutral Zone CB. And there's a swing and a chopper out to second base right at Claire. She picks up the ball, throws it over to first base for a routine out. And fans, there is nothing routine about connecting with Cam and Josh from the Neutral Zone. At Neutral Zone, Cam J and at J Watson 200. Now that's a winning combination. And this Oregon interlude is brought to you by AMI Audio on Twitter. Get in touch with the Neutral Zone. Type in at AMI Audio. And welcome back to the Neutral Zone here on AMI Audio. And uh, now you're going to be listening to another Canadian Paralympic Committee Summit interview with para-athletics, para-athletics athlete Nate Reich. And it's uh, an interview that Brock Richardson uh, did uh, during the Committee Summit. It's my understanding that you were hit in the head uh, from over 150 yards away. Can you tell us about that uh, first and foremost? Yes, I, uh, so I was living in Phoenix, Arizona at, at the time and I was 10 years old and I think naturally as 10 year olds do, they drive their parents a little bit crazy and so I think they're trying to shoot us out to go and do, do something fun for the day and uh, the round was going as planned until the seventh hole, an older group of gentlemen asked to play through and they're honestly trying to take care of us so they said why don't you hit your balls and then go stand 150 yards left of the fairway under a tree because it was about 45 degrees celsius out that day as phoenix can get super hot and remember the first uh person was going to hit and i remember looking back and noticing he was hitting the certain driver that made this tin trash cans tin trash cans sound and uh, then I remember hitting or hearing that sound and then all of a sudden this tingly numb sensation hitting my body and I realized I've been hitting it by a golf ball 
uh, yeah, I had this, and that tingling sen sensation kind of freaked me out. And then I saw a ball jump in a weird, in a weird direction. And um, my friend said, Nate, you just got hit by a golf ball. And I called my mom and she at first thought I was faking it because I was a pretty dramatic kid in general. Um, and so uh, she came and picked me up from the hospital, or sorry, came and picked me up from the golf course and took me to the hospital, took my friends home first. And by the time we got to the hospital, I had become fully paralyzed on the right side of the body. And uh, that was uh, very scary for me. And I had my first seizure while I was in the hospital. And that was kind of my oh crap moment, thinking that I'm probably not gonna get out of the hospital today and go play my all-star baseball tournament the, the following day. It's funny that you say that because you can uh, take the uh, athlete out of the person sometimes, but you can't necessarily take the athlete. Nope, not going to go there with that one. Um, yeah, it's, it's tough sometimes. As you recognize with life, you know, your passion becomes being an athlete. And... Uh, Sometimes it's hard to remove that. And so when we hear, oh, I can't go play my baseball, and people are like, man, but you just got hit in the head with a golf ball. Yeah, but I wanted to go play baseball. And it's, you know, it's tough sometimes. So thank you for sharing that. I think, um, secondly, I'm just curious, when did parasports become known to you in all of your uh, recovery? I knew of the Paralympics earlier on, but I did not know that there was a classification for coordination impairment. Um, so it really came into my vision in 2017 um, when, my, when I had finished college and was pretty dejected with how my college D1 career ended. And my mom said, you know, there's this coordination impairment classification. They all run around your, your PB. There's a guy or two faster than you. But I think, it, I think you would really fit into this classification. And I think it would honestly change your life. You get to travel the world. You would get to, um, you know, get the opportunities that you always dreamt of. And um, so she asked me what country I wanted to run for, U.S. or Canada. And I said Canada. And so she emailed the uh, head of the Paralympic program, Carla Nichols. And uh, then that's kind of how the ball got got rolling and I got classified short, uh, shortly after. What was the draw uh, for you competing for Canada over the United States? Yeah, there's a couple layers there for sure. Uh, first of all, my mom was the main person who helped me for all of my recovery, the one, the one that drove me to all, all those things, the one that really pushed me and the one that I got out of the hospital on Sunday and she told me I'm going to school on Monday. So she was someone that didn't allow me to have excuses and I really uh, appreciate her for that. And so as saying thank you, I wanted to um, compete for Canada as well as my grandpa, Jim Harrison, played for the, Ma the Toronto Maple Leafs, played in NHL for 12 years, played with uh, Bobby Orr and Wayne Gretzky. And I always saw the love that he had for Canada. Every summer I would hang out with him in British Columbia at, at his campground. And uh, I really wanted that sense of national nationalism or pride that for your own country and Canada seemed uh, to be that country for me. You mentioned a couple of things here that I want to touch on. Number one, you said that uh, your mom kind of gave you the, uh, you know, the drive to no nonsense attitude. How do you think that has shaped your career as time has gone on and you've grown up and become a, a para athlete? How do you think that mindset has shaped you into who you are? Uh, personally, I think it's everything. Uh, for me, I think she told me not to take no for an answer. I might do it slower, I might do it differently, but I still need to do it. And so I just learned to adapt. I think anyone with a disability has to adapt. Actually, anyone just in general has to adapt their life. And um, she just taught me to not say excuses. And uh, it's, it's taken me here. And you know, I remember sitting in my room in Tokyo the night before my race and thinking, wow, how cool would that 10-year-old kid paralyzed in the hospital bed think that this is right now? That sports nerd, that kid that just dreamed every night of, of being here, and now I'm actually here. I almost had to have someone pinch me. What would you actually tell that 10-year-old kid? Like, is there a definitive thing that you would say to that 10-year-old kid that you could share? Yeah, I would say 
believe in yourself and bet on and bet on yourself. I, and I would let them know that success isn't linear. You're going to get better quick at some points, and sometimes you're 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 going to regress, and it's going to be really tough. But uh, no matter how tough it gets, stay in the fight, and uh, always always look forward. And uh, let's touch on your grandfather playing for the uh, Toronto Maple Leafs. What has that meant to you, uh, watching him be who he was and have a successful career? Definitely. I didn't understand the gravity of hockey in Canada. I knew it was really, really popular, but I didn't realize till I came to the summit in 2020 and everyone knew who my grandpa was. They're like, oh, you are Jimmy's grandson, aren't you? And I chuckled a lot because uh, I didn't realize how many people how many people knew him and uh you know from everyone that anyone's ever said they have a great respect for him and he was always very modest and humble and uh, i certainly hope i can follow in his footsteps and uh and just to be fully honest with you how proud of me he was to see me have uh the team canada kit on at the paralympic games i know it brought tears to his eyes um and i'm just really proud love that um you touched on it a bit at the beginning saying that you moved uh, from Phoenix to uh, you know train with the Pacific Institute uh, can you tell me about that and how that helped you into where you are yeah so in 2018 I decided to move up to Victoria British Columbia uh, and I knew that if I wanted to be world champion and Paralympic champion that I needed to create a team around me similar to the team that was around me in 2005 when I got paralyzed. The team was gonna look different, was still gonna have some of my family in it, but it was really important to build that, that support staff because it's running at that level is much bigger than yourself. And so that was really important for me to uh, build that team and, uh, and it worked out pretty well in Tokyo. Yeah, and to that point, I. When I was preparing for this, and one of the things that kept constantly coming up was the fact that you are one of the biggest names that have burst onto the scene in uh, para-athletics. What does that mean to you, and how do you balance that for motivation versus pressure? Yeah, um, that's uh, very nice of you to say that. Um, you know, I don't look at myself that way. Um, I've always wanted to repeat in 20. 24 and so uh, you know I still have that goal and I've always had that goal so that was really important to me and to be honest with you I love training so much that almost got taken away from me at at one point and so I I remind myself of that a lot and I know how lucky I am like let's be honest uh, uh, it was a miracle that I'm able to walk and I know there's certain people who I could have my circumstance could have been switched very easily and so um, that's why I still give back to local children's hospitals because I remember how much of an impact it, 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 it made on me. And um, so I just try and be a leader and try to inspire the younger generation. And that really keeps me motivated. You uh, continue to break your own record for the 1500 meter. How do you continue to have the motivation to break your own record? It's one thing to say, I, I broke somebody else's record, but to continuously break your own record, that must be hard because you're beating yourself, you're betting on yourself. How do you get up for, I'm gonna break my own record and I'm gonna better myself again and again? Yeah, so my goal from the very jump was to find my limits and it wasn't to set world records, which yes, they do feel really good when you do them, but I wanted to find where that where that limit is and uh, I still haven't found it. So I think that just keeps me pushing. And to be honest with you, I have the best coach in the world, Heather Henninger. She is so patient. We very much under trained from 2018 to the late of 20, 2019. And then really when it was time to really pick things up, she did it gradually and uh, I honestly, for really the first time I bought into a coach's training and uh, you know, I've always heard that if you buy into something, you really see those results and um, thankfully I finally listened. Why are coaches so important in the life of an athlete and what would you say to somebody who says, what's the value in a coach? There's so much value, but I think there's a, so much value in a coach that 
um, is more than just a coach that checks on you, you know, once a week or every practice to see actually how you're doing because it takes a lot of emotionally and mental energy to be on that edge and run that hard. And so you're not gonna be able to get the results that you want if you're stressed out all the time or just emotionally, you're really taxed. Um, she's, I mean, there's been times where we've gone over that edge and my central nervous system is just completely imploded and I'm about to take a week off. I know other coaches would have just put, uh, say to push through it, but she understands, you know, some of the human movement and uh, part of the body. And so I'm just super lucky to have a coach that keeps on learning. Uh, and honestly, she's much more than a coach. She's gonna be in my life uh, for the rest of my life. If I could accomplish blank in my career, that would be what? If I could accomplish inspiring the next generation of Paralympic athletes, then I would be very happy. What has today meant to you and this whole summit? What's the goal for you? Um, yeah, the whole um, goal for this summit is to get my story out there. And, um, you know, I almost was out of the sport recently because uh, I didn't have the financial um, support to pay for my rent. And so I have no sponsorships. Um, I uh, can fund, I guess, is, is my one sponsor. But when it comes to shoe companies or other corporate companies, I um, have never been sponsored. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think uh, just getting my story out there and having people understand that my injury is like mental health, it's, it's invisible. And sometimes those can be uh, some of the toughest injuries is uh, those ones that people don't see and they just assume that I'm able-bodied whenever they see me walking around. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that I've had to deal with. Awesome. Thank you so much uh, for stopping by and taking the time to uh, share your story. And we greatly appreciate it. Thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed the interview. And that was an interview with Nate Reich, who is a para-athlete in para-athletics. And that was from the Canadian Paralympic Committee Summit interview series that we are currently doing uh, with Brock Richardson. If you like what you heard with this interview or anything else and want to leave us a voicemail, here's how you can do it. Hey, if you want to leave a message for the Neutral Zone, call now, 1-866-509-4545. And don't forget to give us permission to use your message on the air. Let's get ready to leave a voicemail! Welcome back to the Neutral Zone. We are joined by Emma Poynton who continues to be a big contributor to the growth of para-ice hockey, not just locally, but globally. She joins us from Victoria, Australia. Emma, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Cam. How are you going? I'm going okay. How are you going? Yeah, good. I'm actually not in Melbourne, Australia. I'm actually in Czech Republic at the moment, so oh. I'm fresh off a 20-something, uh, I think it was a 25-hour commute, so I'm about 45 minutes south of Prague over here doing a training camp at the moment, so different time zone but pretty uh pretty i'm jet lagged but ready to go here now emma you've been involved with able-bodied hockey uh, women's hockey specifically in australia for quite some time can you tell us a little bit about how that came about and how it led to para hockey yeah so originally my involvement with hockey was sort of through my own hockey involvement so i was if you go back over more more than a decade you could say i start feeling old when i say that but uh if you go back sort of you know my original sporting uh critique was I was a junior tennis player and a junior sprinter, like track sprinter. Then running took over and then sadly I injured my foot as a runner. So I actually did a sports transition into ice hockey. So I started playing ice hockey um, and that was just uh, in law, and, you know, literally enroll in the local hockey school um, or the hockey academy at the local rink. And I learned to skate and learned to play and started a club. That led to sort of being involved in the Australian Women's Ice Hockey League um, from a medical side of things. And I was sort of, I had this ambition where I thought oh, I want to play this. So if I can volunteer my time as a medic, um, I can watch and learn from behind the scenes and get involved. Then I became a player. And then um, I was approached to become general manager of the Australian women's team for the IIHF program. So I did that for a number of years. And it's sort of, it's amazing how some things tumbleweed, life tumbleweed sometimes. And it went from being involved with the Australian women's team to being involved with Para Ice Hockey, uh, which was a blessing in disguise when I was approached when they needed a female coach at one of the world para ice hockey development camps in korea which was in the lead up to the pen on chan games in 2018 and that's where i started meeting the international athletes the international coaches starting to get involved with the international women's program and as i said things just tumbleweeded from there 
Can you give us a glimpse into what the para hockey community looks like in Australia, where it not, isn't typically known for their winter sports? Look, Australia as a whole wasn't known for winter sports globally. Australia isn't known for ice hockey, and Australia definitely isn't known for para ice hockey. So the para ice hockey program is definitely in its you know entry level fundamental sort of stages. So we were lucky enough to coordinate a team to send to the 2018 um, World Para Ice Hockey Seed Pool, which is the third division world championships. They were held in Viramaki, Finland. Unfortunately, we haven't sent teams to the world championships since then. Um, so we are in that sort of fundamental rebuilding stage. So what does it look like? It looks like we're growing. Um, we're re rebuilding models and uh, hopefully we can get a, a model off the ground in you know the coming years. Now, you'd probably have touched on it a little bit already, but if you can maybe expand a bit upon what led you to be connected with the women's para hockey program and what stage it was, what stage it's in from your point of view. The stage it's at, it's definitely growing. They look at building programs at each state, um, trying to recruit athletes, um, both classifiable and non-classifiable to make up numbers, et cetera, and then to ultimately build teams to attend things like the World Para ice hockey world championships and all social tournaments as well i know there's been talk of sending teams to some of the social tournaments that get held throughout north america and europe as well so numbers are fairly low at the moment uh in the sense of women's hockey women's para ice hockey the numbers are extremely low but you know you, you build one or two and you find three or four and before you know it, you've got seven plus two because you do only need seven plus two for a women's team to attend uh the international events yeah, so fast forwarding to 2023, where there are now five teams competing at this year's uh, World Challenge in Green Bay. What Can you dive a little more deeper into what the steps have been to get to that point of having five teams and making sure that num the numbers are still growing? So ultimately, our end game is to try and have women involved in the 2030 Winter Paralympic Games. So the steps we're doing at the moment now is actually sort of feed us ultimately into having both a men's tournament and a women's tournament, hopefully, at the 2030 Winter Paralympic Games. Now, what we did last year is World Para Ice Hockey sanctioned and hosted the first Women's World Challenge, and that was with Team USA, Team Canada, Team Great Britain, and a combined world team. This year, as you mentioned, Claire, we're going to go to five teams, so we'll have USA, Canada, and Great Britain. And we're actually splitting the world team into sort of two continental teams, you can say. So we're going to run one team Europe and one team Asia to expand it to five. The idea of doing that is we can engage more female athletes from more individual nations on those two teams, on team Europe and team Asia. And that will be held uh, the back end of August and September. So the second Women's World Challenge will kick off the 31st of August through to the 3rd of September in Green Bay, Wisconsin, USA, with the ultimate aim of increasing female participation, where hopefully these girls can come and participate, have an absolute blast, go home. And the idea is that maybe you come in from Japan and there's three girls from Japan on Team Asia, and maybe those three girls go home and say, this was absolutely a blast, had a ball. And they find, as I say, they find five friends and they come back next to you with a team, independent team Japan, you know, seven plus two. You're listening to The Neutral Zone here on AMI-audio, and we're joined by our hosts, Claire Buchanan and Joshua Watson, and we're currently speaking with Emma Poynton from the Australian Paradise Hockey. Now, with the World Challenge in its second year, what are some of the things you're looking forward to and what challenges do you think will be uh, faced in the event? I guess without a doubt, the number one thing you look forward to is seeing everyone. You know, it's it's a really tight community, the women's uh, international community. And I, I genuinely look forward to catching up with all the players and all the, the, the coaching staff and the, the team managers and the volunteers associated with the team. So it's such a friendly community environment. And generally, like, uh, you consider people that you might see once or twice a year or more often once a year, true friends. So can't wait to see people on the circuit, so to speak. And also, look, it, it's quite rewarding what we're involved in. We're quite uh, lucky to be involved in what we do because you can see the improvements in the athletes. Um, you can see how much they've improved from this year, last year. You can see the improvements in the teams and not just how the teams play, but how the teams prepare, how the teams present, et cetera. They're becoming more sort of professional, so to speak. So I think 
just seeing the growth of the individual athletes, seeing the growth of the teams, but also just catching up with catching up with all the girls is what I genuinely look forward to. And where can people go to, to watch the tournament? Yeah, so the tournament this year has been held in Green Bay, Wisconsin at the Cornerstone Community Ice Hockey Arena. Um, it will be free to attend. So if you happen to be in the area, it's free to attend. Um, and of course, we encourage all the local hockey interests and people or anyone who wants to fly and have a look to come and come down and have a look. Um, and there will be a live stream, of course, which will share those details through the World Para Ice Hockey social media closer to the uh, 20, uh, sorry, closer to the 31st of August when we kick off. Switching gears to the Para Hockey Sea Pearl Pool World Championships that you uh, helped organize. Tell us what the experience was with it being in Thailand and also how important it was to have it in a place like Thailand. And look, here's the thing. Thailand is exactly like Australia. It's a non-traditional ice hockey nation. You can all argue that, you know, the number of people when you say you're going to world ice hockey championships in Thailand, you can argue everyone just goes, you know, that sort of like you're talking to a puppy dog, that sort of look up going, what? What did you just say? So um, it really was a, what, Thailand has an ice rink, you know, Bangkok has an ice hockey team. And uh, it was very, very, very cool to head to Bangkok. Although the humidity and the temperatures are very hot. But no, look, it was a very, very cool uh, city to head to. And the fact we had France, Great Britain, Austria, Kazakhstan and Thailand all there competing was really special. And I can't commend and thank the Thai local organising committee enough Everything was very, very professionally done. So um, they are excellent hosts. They are very professional in hosting events. And we encourage them to, you know, put their hand up and bid to do that one more time. Um, but look, having the European nations, I think having the adventure, being able to come into Bangkok and travel into a different destination was also a highlight for the athletes. You know, you're there to compete and partake in world championships and represent your country. But it also gives a lot of these athletes you know, a, a once in a lifetime experience, they got to go to Bangkok to play ice hockey. And that's pretty cool. And it's pretty cool indeed. Now that tournament was a historic one. Not only did Great Britain win the tournament for the first time and be promoted to the B pool, but there were women competing in the tournament for the first time. How did that feel to witness that? Look, that it was absolutely spectacular. And it shows the growth of the game that there are more females participating. There are more females highly skilled who can make those national teams so it was pretty special to see females playing in sea pool and definitely would like to see particularly great britain who's been promoted to b pool would love to see those females continue their growth and their development and make further selection and push their way up into b pool as their teams get promoted as well so the direct response to hosting world power ice hockey development camps and the direct response to hosting the women's world challenge was we now see females participating in the um, the ABC Pool World Championships. So it's a definitely a positive sign. We've got more female uh, participation and females of higher skill being selected for their national teams. So slowly, slowly, we can see that, that you know, the idea and the model of our 10-year strategic plan, increasing women's participation and getting us to that 2030 Paralympic start is working. Now coming full circle back to para hockey in Australia, what is next for para hockey in in Australia, but also for the national team, uh, hopefully coming back to the sea pool? Yeah, so look, Australia ultimately needs to look at um, growing the foundations at home first. This is just my personal opinion that we need to grow foundations at home. We need bums in sled participating weekly in a para ice hockey program in each state. So we need to increase the population of participants, both classifiable and non-classifiable in each state. So we've got a really solid foundation of participation rates. And then from that pool of athletes, you then select your national team to travel to sea pool. And then hopefully, my dream would be that we you know, have a pool of athletes to select a women's team to attend the 2024 Women's World Challenge. Australians love sport. This is the thing that Australians love sport and they love crash tackle combat sports. You know, we're, we're good at rugby. We're good at football. We love watching, you know, these tough sports. Well, if you think about it, you know, we're, we're really good at wheelchair uh, basketball. We're really good at wheelchair rugby. Um, that makes sense that, you know, as a general population, we love sports. So 
we should be able to build and recruit para hockey teams. Now, for those that are interested in getting involved in para hockey in Australia, where should they go? Who should they talk to? How should they reach out? Yeah, so there's a couple of different channels. Paralympics Australia is obviously our governing body or our NPC. The International Federation responsible for ice hockey in Australia um, is actually Ice Hockey Australia. So that would be where you'd start. And then they can guide you to your local state association. So, for example, I live in Melbourne, Victoria. If I wanted to participate, I could contact Ice Hockey Australia, the International Federation. They could filter me down and give me contacts to Ice Hockey Victoria and they can guide you in the right direction. So since it's still its niche uh, entry level, I would almost say contacting Ice Hockey Australia is definitely the way to go. Now, we know that the World Challenge is next on your calendar, but once that has concluded, what is next for you personally in, in your contributions to para hockey? Yeah, where to from here? So at the moment, I'm in the Czech Republic uh, participating in a training camp. That's for stand-up hockey. Uh, next week, we actually do have a World Para Ice Hockey training camp so the international development camp is actually taking place in bangkok so that will see athletes from korea japan thailand australia participating in the annual world para ice hockey development camp so that's my next stop i straight uh, literally travel straight from prague through to bangkok on the weekend uh we host the world para ice hockey development camp which is actually really exciting to head back as i said to head back to thailand to the to see the people um, they were very, very good at hosting world championships. So we know they're going to be very good at hosting the international development. Yeah. That's step number one. Step number two is the women's world challenge. That's Green Bay at the end of August, September. After that, we look towards the B pool and C pool world championships. And then throughout all of this, we obviously look to keep growing the women's population globally. You know, so we look at assisting athletes and trying to glo- like grow this game internationally for women's participation and we see what 2024 brings us. That's a lot of different places that you're going to be in, and I feel like that I'm uh, playing a game called Where in the World is uh, Emma Point and, uh, instead of Carmen San Diego. So, But uh, Emma, uh, we do appreciate it's you. It's a game that everyone plays. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, we wish you nothing but uh, success in the future, and we really do hope that uh, the game is able to grow in Australia and, and everywhere as well for the uh, women's teams. And Emma, thank you so much for joining us today and uh, we hope to connect in the future. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. And thanks for you know the opportunity to promote and you know support women's power ice hockey globally. I really do appreciate it. So it was great uh, chatting with Emma and all that uh, she is doing uh, in regards to uh, para ice hockey uh, with Australia and just kind of all over the world. Um, Josh, maybe we'll start off with you and your thoughts on the interview. Yeah, I really enjoyed the interview. I I'm always interested to see how people get involved with with certain things. And so to hear that she started in in what might be considered more of a traditional Aussie sport, like like running, and then transitioned into hockey and then para hockey from there was really fascinating for me. Um, And just to see how involved she is with everything going on from para hockey in general to the women's game to international pool C, the whole nine yards. It's it's really, really fascinating. Yeah, I met Emma in 2018 uh, when she helped uh, facilitate a uh, women's tournam- international tournament in, in the Czech Republic, actually. And um, now knowing her that long, like it's just something that you would just say that... Um, Emma's just one of those people that is so passionate about the game that they just naturally help it grow wherever they go. And um, it's it's funny that um, at the end of that interview that she was talking about, she's just like here and there and everywhere. And it's it shows because everywhere she goes, it's uh, hockey is growing and more people are getting butts in sleds. And um, it's just exciting to see and be a part of like having such a, a great human um, be, uh, connected to, to this, this sport. And, uh, I, I never realized it never dawned on me and I've played multiple sports at the pair, pair level. And, uh, people don't look at Australia as really a sports 
country in general when when you think about it. But when you actually take a look, and yeah, they are um, one of the teams to beat in in rugby, and uh, one of the top teams in Australia for quite some time. And um, they are these kind of powerhouse uh, countries that do invest in their in their uh, disabled athletes. So it's it's exciting to see where Australia will be just in a few years, and just solely because they have Emma to thank. <laughs> oh, Emma, she is just a, a firecracker, and you can feel and hear the passion that she has uh, to be able to grow the game and to make it better. So um, she is a great role model uh, to have for Australian para sports, and it's really going to be interesting uh, moving forward because <laughs> what I thought was uh, kind of funny was when she talked about Australians kind of like their... I forget the word she used, but kind of rough and tumble or like the rugby or the, um, you know, the football um, or Aussie rules football, you know, things like that. And um, yeah, like it, it's so true. And I think I remember uh, Australia at one point in time, I think they were pretty good in the pool as well. Um, swimming so um, yeah they, they certainly uh, should be known as uh, maybe not a powerhouse but they should be known more for their uh, sports uh, than they are and yeah just my personal opinion yeah so just expanding on what you were saying there Kim um, I, I find it really interesting how she's moved not only from as we said the para hockey to or sorry from stand-up hockey to para hockey She's now, as she said, in Czech Republic doing her uh, her training camp there for, uh, I think she said, stand-up hockey. It's just remarkable how one flows into the other, flows back into the first, and just back and forth and back and forth. And I, I think your your comment about, you know, where in the world is Carmen San Diego was a good one, <laughs> because clearly she, she is yeah. all over, at least sort of Southeast Asia and Australia for sure. And probably more if we had a, more of a chance to talk to her. And just hearing um, about what she sees the game doing, how she sees the game growing. And it, it would be really cool one day, I think, to uh, to, to be watching a, a women's world championship or a, a, even a men's world championship in here. And now taking to the ice is Team Australia and have the general public go, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, when they had that slight, uh, that small uh, little uh, appearance at uh, the Sea Pool uh, tournament, uh, that's exactly what it felt like. It was, wow, okay, <laughs> here, here they are. And uh, um, I got to say, it wasn't the prettiest tournament um, they had, <laughs> but hey, that's what Emma like uh, pr preaches is that you got to start somewhere and that's all that matters is that you start. And um, that's kind of the message that she's bringing around globally is that uh, you guys might not have a program right now, but why not now? Why not right now? And uh, to actually have her on board and, and have these kind of steps in place so that uh, things aren't just a, Oh yeah. Like maybe, this could happen or it's a possibility you no know, emma is making sure that all right you want you're thinking about it let's let's put what we need in place to to make it happen and um it's it's just like things like uh this women's world challenge going from uh one more team added here and there and just taking the steps because it's, it's not going to happen overnight and um, that and it's and it's like that in any sport at any level, whether you're de dealing with uh, able-bodied sport or para sport, uh, it's got to it's going to take time. And uh, it's like I said, I met her in 2018, and uh, just excited for what the next five or six years, even more down the road, brings. Absolutely. And uh, with that, uh, Claire mentioned about the program, and uh, that's going to do it for this program uh, for this week. And uh, before I leave, I just want to thank uh, Claire Buchanan and Josh Watson. Our technical producer for this program was Jordan Steves. And the regular host is Brock Richardson. Like I said, he'll be back August 1st. And I will be filling in. And as we, uh, or as I said before, I'm Cam Jenkins. And until we meet again next week. Bye.